I think the genesis of those of, of that whole process, and that's what it was. It was a process. It wasn't just a flash in the pan. Um, began in 1984. Uh, we uh, developed a proposal to submit to the voters that was the first time the police jury had really embarked into the sales tax arena. Prior to that time, road revenues were generated in two fashions. We had eight road districts, which were exactly coterminous with wards. They were just called road districts. Each one had their own tax for roads. And those taxes ranged from very low to very high. If you were in one of the wards, like a ward two, that had very little business, retail, industrial assessment, it was a huge, huge millage for very little revenue production. On the other hand, if you're in Ward 4 that had all the industry, you could have a relatively small uh, millage with a huge revenue generation. Um, that system just didn't work. It, it, that, that's kind of what is in place today still in our school system with the capital because you could have low millages in one ward that has a huge assessment and vice versa. Well, we put, we put a proposal on the ballot that was going to completely restructure the way taxes were generated for public works in the unincorporated areas of the parish. The road district tax, we, we, the proposal was this, that a one cent sales tax in the unincorporated area would be placed for a vote. A covenant resolution, the first time we ever used that word tied to a resolution, and I would give credit for that to a guy named Fred Benton, an attorney from Baton Rouge who is a legend, was a legend in his own time and continues to be a legend in terms of his expertise on bonding and those taxation and those kind of things, suggested that, uh, in fact, had an, even op an opinion that uh, if you did a covenant resolution, if it was adopted concurrent to the call of an election, the items in that covenant would be binding not only on the governing body at the time of the election, but on future governing bodies succeeding those folks. Huge. That was huge to make those kind of promises. That, I, that had a lot to do, I think, with the ability of that tax to pass. But what the tax said was if that one cent sales tax in the unincorporated area passed the vote, the existing uh, ad valorem millages in the eight road districts would be phased out in two years and eliminated, regardless of how much time they had left on their authority to be levied, they would be eliminated. Not, not rolled back to be rolled up later, but eliminated completely. The parish-wide road tax that was in place at that time, it was about three, I want to say maybe three point, three and a quarter mil, something like that. It was in the covenant resolution to be dedicated to capital improvements completely instead of to road hard surfacing instead of just for maintenance. The sales tax was going to be allocated for maintenance and a portion of it for capital allocated on a formula of by ward of population and road mileage, 50% weighted on both. Pretty good, pretty good formula. I mean, for instance, the school system would do that they'd allocate their capital dollars to the wards based on pupil uh, enrollment, population, those kind of things, it, it would be a lot fairer than, than really what happens today where each ward's got to, got to do its own thing. Um, so that was huge. Well, it passed. So between starting in 1985, we began using that capital money from the sales tax and from that parish-wide ad valorem tax to hard surface the major roads at that time. We had, uh, you were talking primarily about the arterial roads. Ward 4 had a unique system over there because they had had a lot of money from that old road district tax. They had done what was called at the time a three shot on a huge number of miles of road in Ward 4. At the time it was done, it was great because there wasn't any shell, there wasn't dust coming, but but it was a really poor man's way of getting out of the dust because they didn't prepare the base and do a soil cement base. They just squirted liquid asphalt and put some rock on it and everything, and it, it, it gave what appeared to be a hard surface road, but only for a little while. When it started breaking down, the cost of 
all you could do was tear the road back up and put it back to shell. You couldn't patch it like you could a good hot mix asphalt road. Well, we had a huge amount of roads in Ward 4 like that, so a lot of those were redone and done the right way. The second, I guess, leg of that program came in the early 90s when there, the success in the unincorporated areas from the 1984 sales tax was so great that uh, we decided it was time to go to the next level of that. So we looked at a, a cent and a half sales tax, again, only in the unincorporated areas, to do two primary things. Expand this hard surfacing program that we had begun in 1984 and provide solid waste collection on a house-to-house -house basis. That tax was one of the more unique taxes. In effect, we listed every road by covenant that was going to be hard surfaced. Well, all the roads, we had done most of the major roads from 84, so all the roads that were on this tax were roads where people were living on. So the people that were going to be voting on this tax were not only going to get their road hard surfaced, they were going to get their garbage picked up, and they weren't even going to have to pay a monthly fee to do it. Uh, one other little aspect of that that could have been considered by some as legalized vote buying, I guess, uh, was that during the period of the 80s, from 84 up to 92, a large number of roads were blacktopped under what was termed the front foot assessment plan, where because there was no money to uh, blacktop a residential road during that period of time. People were, they were not wanting to choke on the dust. They had built nice homes in a lot of those new subdivisions that had come about and they were living on a shell road because it wasn't until 1979 that the police jury put as a requirement on subdivision development hard surfacing. So a lot of these subdivisions that were developed in the late 70s and on into the early 80s because they were started before the ordinance was adopted had beautiful homes sitting on shell roads. So people would come in, file a petition to pay for their road on a front foot assessment basis. If you had 100 feet of, uh, of your frontage on that road and a lot you paid X number of dollars, we'd take bids and it'd divide it up and everybody paid a portion of that. Well, because the tax was put on in 92 and a lot of those people were still paying for their, for their roads, if we were going to be blacktopping, maybe, their, maybe the road next to their road hadn't been blacktopped on the front foot assessment. We were going to blacktop it for free to them. Felt it inappropriate to not in some way find a way to compensate those folks that had, had, had already paid or were still paying for that. So Fred Benton again came to the rescue and developed a plan and a, a format for how those people could be recompensated for what they, a portion of what they had put on their road. It would have been hard to imagine why anybody in the unincorporated area would have voted no. Now, some people did, but it passed overwhelmingly, and, uh, and it was renewed again in 2002. But uh, those two things, we went from having uh, roughly 45% of our roads blacktopped to over 90% of the parish roads blacktopped today because of those two programs that both of which are still in existence. The ta both taxes are still being collected. They've both been renewed. Um, and I, I think it's probably one of the you know, one of the most unique funding proposals. I don't think many, many other parishes have availed themselves of that, but uh, I, I think that's what brought us where we are today is those two those two programs. Moss Bluff even, even though they were they were not in the 1992 tax because the school, they, we had the tax on the ballot there, but the school district had a tax on the same ballot and the people voted for schools rather than roads. They were part of the 84 tax, so a lot of the, uh, the arterial roads in that area were blacktop, which made it easier for people to move and have access to those areas for new subdivisions to be developed. Yeah, there's no question about the fact that those, that transportation system, and that's not unique to here, e look anywhere where there's a good transportation system and you're going to see development. Uh, we've always used the Ambassador Caffrey uh, thing over in Lafayette as an example of that. I mean, I, you know, I remember the days that they built that road and it was out in the middle of nowhere. It takes you probably an hour to get down that road now because of the traffic level and the development that's taken place along there. So it is truly one of those if you build it they will come type of syndromes and, and we've seen that. You, you mentioned the 
the possible negatives from that. Sure, there, there are. I mean, I, I talked about some of that a while ago relative to drainage. I mean, you when you start building subdivisions and putting roof lines and slabs and everything, displacing water that used to go in an area uh, where it would just sit and nobody cared, all of a sudden you've got to do something about that. That's, a, that's a, You've got to find a way to move that water off of there in a way that doesn't impact negatively people that had already developed earlier. Um, just infrastructure in general. You know, you've got to build up your fire protection. You've got to make sure your water lines are extended. You've got all those kind of things that come with development. It's called urban sprawl in some areas, and a lot of people cite the negatives of urban sprawl. Uh, as people move out of municipal areas where all those services are already in place, paved roads, fire, fire protection, water lines, sewer lines, as they move out of those developed areas into previously undeveloped areas where that infrastructure is not in place, you, you vacate all the all the advantages, you vacate those areas where all those places are, uh, all those services are already available. And so that sprawl is, is kind of a nationwide problem uh, that I think we were probably a little bit unprepared for when you, when you look at the 90s to 2000, 1990 to 2000, that huge number of people that moved out there. Um, I don't know what we could have done really to prepare for that because capitalism being what it is, people have the right to go and develop. We had places, we had, at least we had ordinances in place that when they developed, they had to put paved roads in, which was not the case prior to 1979. So we weren't taking on those kind of additional responsibilities that the taxpayers as a whole would have to pay for. But there were other infrastructure issues like water and sewer and whatever that, that were part of that that are still being discussed today, particularly sewerage.